ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Seattle Cisco Q3 2020 Financial Results Conference Call. <clears throat> At this time, all participants' lines are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. If you should require any further assistance, please press star 0 for the operator. I would now like to hand today's conference over to Greg Lamp. Please go ahead. Thank you, Carmen. Good morning, and welcome to Sienna's 2020 Fiscal Third Quarter Review. We are conducting today's call from various remote locations. On the call today is Gary Smith, President and CEO, and Jim Moylan, CFO. Scott McFeely, our Senior Vice President of Global Products and Services, is also with us for Q&A. In addition to this call and the press release, we have posted to the investor section of our website an accompanying investor presentation that reflects this discussion as well as certain highlighted items from the quarter. Our comments today speak to our fiscal Q3 2020 performance, developments in our business, and our view on current market dynamics, including with respect to COVID-19, as well as our outlook. Today's discussion includes certain adjusted or non-GAAP measures of standards results of operations. A detailed reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures <clears throat> to our GAAP results is included in today's press release. Before turning the call over to Gary, I'll remind you that during this call, we'll be making certain forward-looking statements. Such statements, including our guidance and long-term financial targets, are based on current expectations, forecasts, and assumptions regarding the company and its markets, which include risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from the statements discussed today. These statements should be viewed in the context of the risk factors detailed in our most recent 10Q filing, as well as in our upcoming 10Q, which is required to be filed with the SEC by September 11th. We expect to file by that date. Sienna assumes no obligation to update the information discussed in this conference call, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. As always, we will allow for as much Q&A as possible today, so we ask that you limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up. With that, I'll turn the call over to Gary. Thanks, Greg, and good morning, everyone. Today, we delivered outstanding third quarter results across the board, and similar to last quarter, our performance in Q3 demonstrates that our strategy, focused on innovation leadership, diversification, and global scale, has enabled us to manage well through the challenges of the current environment. The Siena team has been a key element of our performance, and businesses, as we know, are all about people. Their focus, resilience, and drive to innovate and serve our customers is unrivaled in the industry. I remain incredibly proud of our global workforce and their collective efforts, including their continued volunteerism and charitable activities. Notwithstanding our strong quarterly performance and the resiliency of our business model, we are seeing negative effects of the pandemic and greater economic uncertainty weigh on our near-term outlook. We believe that this is being driven by an impact on the velocity and to some extent deprioritization of new business initiatives in general, as well as an increasing customer caution on budget decisions and the timing of spend, namely with service providers, as they are in turn beginning to feel the negative effects from large segments of their enterprise business. As we said last quarter, Despite the favorable increase in bandwidth requirements, we are not immune to these dynamics as they continue to play out in the market. And we will provide more color and perspectives on this momentarily. Firstly, I'd like to discuss the key performance metrics in our third quarter and provide a few highlights from across the business that really emphasize the inherent resilience and competitive strength of our business. So far this year, we believe we've taken an additional one plus percent of global market share. And I would stress that this is largely without the benefit of an increasing number of significant strategic design wins that we have yet been able to monetize given the current climate. Accordingly, we delivered outstanding financial performance in Q3. We had a great revenue quarter, and our gross margin, OPEX management, and operating margin were all very strong and, in fact, better than expected. 
Indeed, our adjusted operating margin exceeded 22%. And I think this really demonstrates the differentiated operating leverage in our business model that we've created. And we had excellent cash flow, finishing the quarter with approximately 1.2 billion in cash. Our performance this quarter also reinforced our innovation leadership and strong competitive position in critical areas of the network. Our latest generation modem, WaveLogic 5, remains the only 800 gig solution available in the market and is in volume production today. We are not just sampling or trialing this leading technology, we're actually shipping it for commercial deployments with a range of customers, including service providers, web scalers, subsea operators, and research and education institutions. In fact, we've already secured roughly 50 design wins for WaveLogic 5 Extreme, and this is a rate faster than previous generations, as the networks today are more ready than before for a step function in capacity to support demand. In just over three months of commercial availability, we've shipped more than 1,000 WaveLogic 5 coherent modems to almost 40 customers around the globe with several of those networks already carrying live traffic. I think this is a strong testament to our innovation leadership and clear validation of our ability to execute and deliver against aggressive technology roadmaps supported by a very robust supply chain. In addition to our market-leading optical performance, we had several new wins in Q3 for our packet business. We now have more than a dozen customers for our adaptive IP solutions, including Telefonica UK and SK Tellink, which we announced in Q3. And this is amongst additional tier one service providers who valued our automated open and lean approach to IP architectures. And of course, we also continue to see strengths with existing customers of our packet portfolio like AT&T. On the Blue Planet side in Q3, we delivered on a strategic mobile transformation in the Asia Pacific region secured significant upsell business with several large service provider customers domestically and internationally, and added a number of new enterprise logos as well. Now moving to the overall market. Secular demand drivers for connectivity obviously remain very much intact as network traffic grows and the adoption of cloud architectures continues apace. So the fundamentals of our business are absolutely unchanged as we look to the future. Nevertheless, as I alluded to in my opening remarks, late in the fiscal third quarter, we began to see some of the effects of COVID-19 manifest in our business to a greater degree than anticipated, as well as increased economic uncertainty. Specifically, we began to experience a meaningful slowdown in orders and a softening of our outlook. I would stress that the decline is broad-based across our service providers, customers globally, whose spend now appears to have been somewhat front-end loaded in the calendar year, resulting in lower orders in our third quarter from a number of our large customers in this segment. We believe the softness in our order flow and our reduced visibility is the result of a couple of customer-related dynamics. Firstly, COVID-19 continues to have an adverse impact on the velocity of business in general and particularly new business initiatives. Limitation on physical access at ours and our technology partners' sites continue to create challenges for executing on some network projects that we've already won. And generally, in this uncertain environment, customers' ability and willingness to move forward with new business initiatives is constrained. In fact, the best evidence for this dynamic is evident in our recent gross margin performance, which reflects a larger percentage of revenue from existing businesses versus from new design wins and early life in projects, which tend to carry somewhat lower margins. The second dynamic is customers have grown more cautious about the near-term outlook for their businesses and are beginning to exercise greater restraint and respect to their capex spend. This is particularly evident with our service provider and MSO customers, as certain large segments of their enterprise businesses are being negatively impacted by the pandemic and economic uncertainties. Overall, I would say that customers are running their networks hotter 
and they are carefully prioritizing where and when to add network capabilities. And they've proven their ability to do this for extended periods of time, as we've seen before with previous economic conditions that are challenging. Conversely, with our web scale customers, the year has pretty much so far played out as we expected directionally, with some COVID-related reduction in spending. Specifically in fiscal 2020, as expected, one of our large web scale customers reduced its optical spend as it had some absorption and changes to its architecture. While I would stress that we've gained share, significant share with others, including a new significant architectural win with one of the major players that is new to Siena. We now believe that overall optical spend growth in this web scale segment will be flat to low single digits for this year versus the 7 to 10% that was expected at the beginning of the year. And I would stress that our competitive position remains strong in this key vertical, and we remain confident that we have gained share in all of the other accounts despite while one large customer absorbing during the year. Therefore, over our market share continues to expand in this sector. While the strong diversity in our businesses generally enables us to manage through ebbs and flows in any one customer segment or geography, the breadth and magnitude of COVID-19 challenges and economic uncertainties are making it more difficult to do so. As a result of the broader economic conditions and related market dynamics, we now expect overall market optical growth, excluding China, will slow. In fact, we now believe that the market will be roughly flat to down for this year. And this dynamic is already being reflected in some of the latest industry analyst forecasts, and we expect that sentiment to continue. Accordingly, we expect our orders and revenue to be adversely impacted for the next few quarters. However, I would stress that we believe that these challenges will be short-term in nature, with bandwidth demand increasing at approximately 25 to 30 percent year on year. We do not believe it will be possible for our customers to serve that level of demand for more than a few quarters without increasing capacity. Importantly, our competitive position is incredibly strong and we remain the clear market share leader. We believe that uncertain conditions will only reinforce and possibly accelerate a flight to quality in terms of vendor selection and the ability to maintain investment velocity. And we have the scale, focus, and balance sheet to not only continue differentiating ourselves, but also manage through these conditions effectively. And we intend to press down on that advantage to ensure both our own and our customers' long-term success. With that, I'll hand over to Jim to talk you through our Q3 results and outlook. Thanks, Gary. Good morning, everyone. We're pleased to report another strong quarterly performance with our Q3 results today, driven by continued execution of our strategy. Total Q3 revenue was $977 million, which, like last quarter, reflects strengths in our North America and EMEA regions. Q3 was also remarkable with respect to customer diversification, with non-telco customers generating more than 43% of total revenue. This included direct web scale revenue, 25%, revenue R&E and enterprise, 9%, MSOs, 9%. Adjusted gross margin was 48%. This is higher than our estimate of current run rate gross margin. I'll remind you that we said last quarter we believe our current run rate margin is between 43 and 45 percent. It's higher now because, as Gary mentioned, our revenue mix in the quarter included a larger percentage of revenue from existing business, as opposed to revenue from new design wins and early in life projects, which tend to carry lower gross margins. Adjusted operating expense in the quarter was $251 million, lower than expected, mainly due to continued lower travel costs as a result of COVID-19. With respect to profitability measures, in Q3, we delivered adjusted operating margin of 22.4%, adjusted net income of $166 million, and adjusted EPS of $1.06 above our expectations, largely due to the higher gross margin. 
In addition, in Q3, cash from operations was very strong at $175 million. Adjusted EBITDA in Q3 was $241 million, and we generated free cash flow in the quarter of $160 million. We ended the quarter with approximately $1.2 billion in cash and investments. Our balance sheet remains a significant competitive differentiator, particularly in the current environment where financial strength and resiliency are critical. And it affords us the flexibility to continue investing in our business for the long term. Before I provide our guidance for the fourth quarter, I'll reiterate Gary's comments around long-term secular demand drivers, specifically that the underlying trend of growth in bandwidth demand remains intact and that our competitive position has never been stronger. However, the length and breadth of the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on the global economy remains uncertain and it is leading to more cautious customer spending behaviors and ongoing difficulties with operationalizing projects. This resulted in Q3 orders coming in significantly below revenue, something we have not seen for some time, and a softening of our near-term outlook. Taking all of that into account, including our revised view on market growth for this year of roughly flat to down, we expect our Q4 performance will be as follows. Revenue in the range of 800 to $840 million. Adjusted gross margin in a range of 46 to 48%. And adjusted, adjusted operating expense of approximately 255 to $260 million. <clears throat> Importantly, based on our year-to-date performance and these projections, we now expect to achieve approximately 17% adjusted operating margin for fiscal year 2020, above the revised target that we provided last quarter. This level of expected performance for fiscal 2020 reflects a combination of current market dynamics, as well as deliberate initiatives we've taken in several key areas of our company over the last few years to reduce expenses. It also demonstrates the long-term operating leverage potential of our business model. I'll close by looking beyond Q4. Based on what we see today and with our limited visibility, we expect current market dynamics, in particular the challenges around restrained customer spending as well as business velocity, will persist for a few quarters. As always, we remain focused on executing our strategy. We have experience and a consistent track record of success, successfully managing the business through difficult times. Today, we are an even stronger and more diversified business than during this challenging macroeconomic environments. And as a result of our fundamental strengths, we have the unique capability to continue investing in our business, in our people, in our products, and in our customers with a focus on managing the business for the long term and continued market leadership. And we expect, even during this time of lower revenue, to generate strong gross margins and profitability. Carmen, we will now take questions from the sell side analysts. Thank you. And your first question will come from the line of Simon Leopold with Raymond James. Please go ahead with your question. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so. In terms of what's going on with these trends and uh, what sounds like uh, some absorption and, and weaker trends, uh, is there a split in terms of what's going on, U.S. telcos versus international telcos and, and the web scale? It, it sounds to me the impression I have is that the issue is more acute with U.S. telco and cable, uh, and are you seeing that behavior extending outside the U.S. or into hyperscale? Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, I would say that it's, it, it's quite widespread, you know, both, both domestically, North America, and, and internationally, uh, and it's, service it's, it's largely service providers and MSOs. Um, so it's sort of across the board there. And I, and I think, you know, the, the dynamic to that 
is the fact that they can run their, their networks a little hotter, but I also think in terms of the economic caution, they're beginning to see impact of large sections of their enterprise customers, you know, have challenges. And I think that's a consistent issue, not just in North America, but in Europe and, and, and around the world. So, you know, there's some, there's some logic as to why we'd see it in, in, in international carriers as, as well. Obviously, some carriers are more exposed than others and the sort of, you know, the, the, to various extents. But it is quite widespread amongst the service providers. On web scale, I think it's, it's much less so, because I think it's a different, different set of dynamics there. And I think, you know, they're largely performing as we thought. I think the growth rate this year is going to be lower than we'd anticipated. But I think that's to do with, you know, some challenges around building out data centers, et cetera. That has slowed, particularly internationally, their ability to do that. And you had one, so one web scale player in particular, you know, had a large absorption and, and, uh, is running their network hotter as well. But we saw pretty good growth with all of the other uh, web scale players. So I think it's less web scale and more service provider, uh, Simon, for sure. One other, thing I'll just... mention, Simon, uh, one other thing I'll mention, Simon, is that uh, we're seeing particular weakness in India. And remember, India started the year with a few uh, secular factors. COVID has hit India, and India has been shut down basically for several months. So India has been uh, a uh, clear effect on us. Great. And, and as a follow-up, I wanted to see if you could maybe offer an, us an update on the prospect for winning business as a result of Huawei backlash, whether it's because operators choose to move away from Huawei or Huawei simply can't build products. Uh, this is something we've been hearing more about. The U.S. government's taken further action. So uh, we'd, we'd love to hear your latest on that topic. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, you know, generally a positive uh, dynamic for us and a, a sort of tailwind that I think is, is going to stretch out over the next one to three years. You know, I, I, would, I would say that that dynamic is going to take time. These are big strategic decisions by large uh, carriers. And predominantly in Europe is what we're talking about. We, we are engaged with those carriers. We have secured some of those design wins, and they will roll out. But I think it is a one to three year dynamic. And, you know, the operational challenges around those kinds of decisions are non-trivial as well. You know, they're, they're very ensconced into those networks, the back office. And it's not just an economic challenge for the carriers. It's a big operational challenge, too. So, you know, yes, we think it's a very positive dynamic for us. I think it plays out over a longer period of time than perhaps the you know, the, uh, the, the media might uh, uh, lead one to believe, but it is happening, and we are, we are securing wins as a result of that dynamic. You know, they are in our design wins, but they're not showing up in revenue yet. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. And your next question is from the line of George Nodder with Jeffrey. Please go ahead with your question. Hi guys, thanks very much. I, I appreciate it. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about this is, you know, we just came through an earnings season, of course. Um, you know, companies on a on a June uh, quarter, and yeah, you know, we didn't see this sort of guidance from companies like Infinera. Uh, you know, certainly Juniper is a, is a name that I tend to comp with you guys in terms of service provider exposure. Um, you know, could you just talk about, you know, why your experience here seems to be, you know, quite a bit different relative to some of those other names? Yeah, I'd say, George, that uh, you will be hearing that, this from our competitors, peers, and even customers, frankly. Uh, we have a quarter that's slightly off in terms of most of our peers, competitors, and customers, and so um, uh, since this phenomenon really occurred late in our quarter, and specifically in the last month of the quarter, it might not have been evident to them at the time they did their earnings. We believe this is very uh, broad, and everyone will be talking about this over the next uh, several quarters. We, we have the kind of global visibility that others don't quite have, you know, particularly with global service providers, which is where this is focused. And, uh, and so I, I think that's why we're seeing it a bit earlier than others. So is it fair to say that um, sort of the, the, the meat of the, the pressure on orders really came in in the month of August? 
I, I, would, I would say that from an outlook point of view, orders, I mean, Q3, we delivered a fabulous Q3, and so it really didn't impact you know, Q3 much, but our outlook towards the end of the end of Q3, I think it, it, it began to change. Yeah, remember we said that our orders in Q3 were meaningfully lower than our revenue, which is the first time that's happened in a long, long time. So we definitely saw the orders effect in Q3. Didn't see a revenue effect in Q3. Got it. Okay. And would you? Is there a book to bill ratio you could uh, you could share with us? We haven't given that. But I'd say our, our uh, backlog did come down. Okay. Thanks, George. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Your next question is from the line of John Marchetti. With Stiefel, please go ahead with your question. Thanks very much. I'd just like to follow up a little bit on that, that timing question that George just asked. Um, you know, Gary, is it a situation as your customers are starting to get their own operations back to normal and, as you suggested, they're starting to look at what their business prospects are that, that, that you think really drove the sort of sharp deceleration in what you're expecting for the second half of the year? I, I think it's a combination of these factors, John. I think there's a certain extent with pull forwards. You know, you had a number of carriers you know, who were in a, a, a position to secure, you know, continuity of supply, you know, place those orders on. We had a very strong, you know, Q, Q2 orders, as we said. So I think you've got that dynamic and a little bit of bleed off and absorption. And I think you've got these other two elements that whilst overall, you know, the logistical issues around COVID have eased a little bit, I think that's fair. I think they're looking at it and saying, you know, they're not prioritizing their new business initiatives, sort of, you know, new route wins and, and new adoption of technology generally. They're focused on how do we keep the network going and run it a little bit hotter. And I think they're also bumping into, you know, frankly, the realities of some of their enterprise customers really, you know, uh, suffering significantly in whole sectors, you know, such as uh, retail transportation, hospitality, you know, restaurants, and that's beginning to impact their, uh, you know, their perspective on, on outlook. So I think, John, it's all sort of three of those uh, elements c coming together, if you will. And, and then maybe as a follow-up there, Gary, how do I think about your expectation for the continued momentum in 800 gig adoption? Obviously, you've gotten off to a, a stronger than expected start or a very strong start with, with you know, Wave Logic 5 and particularly Extreme, how do we, you know, do you expect that to slow then as, as, as customers keep evaluating this, or, or how should we think about that if, if, if they're sort of pulling back on some new project stuff? Thank you. Scott, do you want to take that? Yes, sir, Gary. Um, uh, thanks, John. Um, it's interesting because as you, as you pointed out, you know, the pace of new design wins is actually um, – is, is quite pleasing to us. And if I sort of compare it back to the previous generation, you know, we've got over 50 design wins in, in, in our back pocket now. That's probably about twice the rate of design wins from the previous generation in the same time period. But interestingly enough, if I look at the volume shift against those, those it's actually probably a little bit smaller than, than the first piece. And I think that's you know, exactly a microcosm of, uh, of the broader picture that we're talking about. Um, you know, obviously monetizing new technology goes through a couple of phases, but if I simplify it, you know, there's a selection phase and then there is a operationalization phase. Selection phase is everything from, you know, the competitive RFP tenders to lab bay costs to, you know, trials, uh, you know, commercial negotiation contract, et cetera. We've gotten through that uh, at, a, at, a, at a great rate and, uh, you know, RFP pace hasn't, hasn't slowed down at all. What has slowed down is the operationalization of this stuff, and you can see it sort of in a, in a slightly lower set of uh, volume units uh, that, that are shipped against a, a bigger number of design wins. Those design wins don't go away, by the way. We will monetize those going forward in the future. It's just a little bit slower than uh, we would like. Thanks, John. Thank you. And your next question is from the line of Meta Marshall with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead with your question. Great, thanks. Um, a couple of questions for me. One, um, you know, one of your competitors is talking about one of the ways the Huawei opportunity could kind of come to fruition is a move to open line systems in Europe in particular, and just wanted to kind of get your sense of, you know, how you saw uh, the Huawei opportunity kind of coming 
in over the next couple of years, do you think that that could be the trigger that would cause a move to open line systems? And then, you know, maybe second point, you noted earlier in the year that your visibility with what skill customers is pretty high. Just a sense of, you know, clearly there's been a slowdown in international bills, but just how do you view your visibility with what skill customers versus uh, your tel service provider customers? Thanks. So, so when I take the first one, Mader, um and Scott, feel free to, to, to add to this for answer the second piece. Um, I, I think it's unlikely to move to an open line system in Europe with, with, with the Huawei. The, the, the Huawei replacement is quite a complicated set of issues around back office, operational elements, et cetera. So, you know, I think that's going to take a while to play out. As I said, it's probably a one to three year opportunity. We're already beginning to deploy, you know, on a couple of those uh, that, we've, that we've won. And architecturally, you know, I, I don't think that's going to create any kind of shift to open line systems, frankly. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really see that. Scott, I don't know whether you have any additional no, color I, on that. I, I would, I would uh, agree with that totally, Gary. I mean, open line systems is not a new phenomenon. Um, from a technology perspective, or even from a deployment perspective, you look at how we, how uh, some of the web scalers consume the, the technology. The issue for you know the large European or or any global global carriers is all the operational challenges of a new vendor, whether that's just uh, you know the uh, the transponder systems or, or a closed loop system. It, does, it doesn't really change that dynamic, and that's the, the gating factor for actually switching off of uh, off of Huawei. On the second pretty question, Mita, on the, on the web scale piece, we have very good visibility with the web scale folks. You know, obviously, you've got less, you know, less less customers there, a more concentrated set of players. Um, you know, and that's largely played out as we thought. We do have a significant new design win with a new web scale player, which is new to Sienna. We were always missing one of the large web scale players, which we've now added to our design wins, and that'll start to roll out as we go, as, as we go through next year. We have pretty good visibility to, to their uh, demand dynamics. The only dynamic we're really seeing there is a slight slowdown in the build out of data centers, which again is largely a logistical issue and largely you know, outside, of the, outside of the US to do with their submarine uh, cable provisioning, et cetera, which is you know, to, be, to be expected. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Your next question is from the line of Rod Hall with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead with your question. Yeah, hi guys. Thanks for the question. I wanted to uh, focus in on the margins a little bit and see if I know Gary. I, I'm trying to piece together your commentary that you know the margins are so much better. The gross margins are so much better because of the new towards existing projects. That all makes sense to me. Uh, but then. The fact that you're talking about the, you know, the weakness developing late in the quarter, and then you guys are guiding margins down a little bit for next quarter. I, I'm just curious: Are we? Would you then say we're at a new normal for mar gross margins here, due to that mix shift, or does that mix shift continue to play out over the next few quarters as the new business maybe is a little bit weaker? So I'm just kind of curious what the trajectory of gross margins should be here, and then. My second question is on OPEX. I just I, I get that you're getting a natural benefit in OPEX from the lack of travel, but could you just talk maybe, Jim, a little bit about are you going to take any proactive OPEX control measures here, or do you really not need to take measures because you're getting this natural OPEX um, impact from the lockdowns and so on? Thanks. Thanks, Rod. On the gross margin point, uh, we are and we expect to be in a uh, range higher than our sort of run rate margin of 43 to 45 percent as long as our revenue remains at a, at a slower pace. And, and that's because our revenue is going to be at a slower pace because our um, mix of revenue consists mostly of existing business and not a lot of the new wins that we've not yet monetized or the new wins that we're going to get once the coronavirus effects on the business ameliorate. So, yes, our gross margin is likely to be above our run rate margin for the next several quarters. Uh, we do think that once we get past this, because again, we said it's, it's a few quarters, we will be back in the business of monetizing new wins and winning new business, and we think that our margin will trend toward that 43 to 45 percent. That's our view today. 
On OPEX, what I would say is that uh, we're actually quite a bit below our OPEX expectation for this year, mainly due to travel and some other things that COVID has affected in our ability to get things done. Actually, when we go into next year, we intend to invest in our business significantly. We think that it's the right thing to do strategically. We believe that uh, we can attack a number of new markets and architectures with the things that we're bringing to market in our innovation uh, machine. And so we don't intend to reduce our, cap, our, our OPEX by any significant amount. Of course, we're going to be trimming around the edges, sure, but not in any meaningful way. The other thing I'd add, Rod, around that is that, you know, during the course of the last two to three years, the course of the last two to three years, um, you know, we have significantly uh, improved our operating efficiencies from an expense point of view, and we've done that during, you know, a very deliberate move to uh, optimize our operating expenses, which we basically have reduced consistently during the last two to three years which has helped, you know, produce the, the bottom line performance that we've got. And I think, you know, I just emphasize what Jim said earlier around profitability. You know, and I think it talks to, A, the strength of our overall business model and what we've done, and, two, our competitive position that even during this, uh, you know, reduced outlook period, we will still be profitable, uh, you know, as a business, and we will still generate cash. So, you know, I think that says a lot for the strength of, you know, both the business model and our competitive position. Okay, thanks. I, I guess I was just assuming that, um, you know, on the gross margins, I was assuming that um, there ought to be some trajectory, continued trajectory upward, or it seems like there might be a mix shift continuing because these things don't all, always happen overnight. So, But it sounds like you're saying that the gross margins have kind of peaked here due to that mix shift, and now we'll stay at this level for the foreseeable future. I guess, is that the right way to see it, Jim, or, or am I right to think that this isn't happening overnight and there is some sort of a trajectory? I think that you, what you just said is correct. Our margins are very high, 48%, and we don't expect them to go up from here. We think that they will be in the 46 to 48% range in Q4. Remember, uh, you, your comment about uh, not happening overnight, remember, we've enjoyed pretty good gross margins so far this year. And part of that is, is in, in fact, the most, uh, the largest part of it was in Q2, because Q2 was affected by the lack of new wins. So uh, this hasn't happened overnight. It's been a, a function of moving through this year. Thanks, Bob. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Rob. Your next question is from the line of Paul Silverstein with Cowan and Company. Please go ahead with your question. Yeah, some clarifications, if I may. First off, Jim, have you backed away from your previous previous statements regarding holding OPEX growth to low single digits next year and beyond? I think I know you've made that comment previously. No, no, I did not make the comment. I did not make the comment that we're going to hold our OPEX growth to uh, low to to below revenue. I made no comment about that. I will say that our OPEX this year is artificially low as a result of the lack of travel. And so we're going to see an increase in OPEX next year as we return to travel. Um, and we intend to continue investing. But no, it's, it's definitely our intent that we continue to drive operating leverage by so growing mm -hmm. revenue in OPEX. And, Jim, the, the direct question in terms of keeping it to low single digit, do you, do you already have a plan in place where you have a number in mind, or you're just thinking that you'll keep it below revenue growth? Well, we don't have a number in place for 21. But I could, just to clarify, I'm going to state this again for the uh, modelers among you. Our OPEX this year is artificially low. And so the comparison between 20 and 21 OPEX is going to be affected by the fact that 2020 OPEX is artificially low. If you go back and uh, compare over longer periods, absolutely we, we're committed to that trend. And, and then going back to the Japan issue, the softness you all are referencing, I, I recognize it's fairly new and vintage, but is it 
when it hit, or you has it stabilized, or are you still seeing erosion as you've gone week by week over the course of the last month? And have over and above demand issues, have you had any meaningful competitive losses? I think let, let me let me take the the last one first. I think the answer to that is uh, is no, absolutely not. Uh, Scott alluded to it, you know, and I, and I I want to be clear around this. The you've seen operational challenges around the COVID thing and the accumulated issues, uh, you know, around that. But the RFP activity, you know, has continued, uh, and we are winning more than our fair share on that. If you look at the market growth that we've had in the first half of the year, you know, we think we took over a percentage point of global market share in the first half of the year. And that, you know, we're just beginning to roll out Wave Logic 5. We've got a number of significant design wins that we've not monetized yet. And we keep adding to those every quarter. So we are winning more than our fair share of it. So we're growing market share and we're growing, importantly, you know, the design wins for the future. Some significant design wins against, you know, some inherent competitive accounts. So, you know, we're in a very strong position from, from a competitive point of view. Jim, do you want to take the first part of that? Yeah. What I've said here, Paul, is as we've said a lot in the past, we do a lot of forecasting and we do a weekly look at uh, what, we're, what we're seeing in the quarter. And what I would say is over the past few weeks, as we rolled up our view for Q4, it's been in the range of the number that we're talking about. Or can I just ask for one? We've got to move on to others. Sorry. Thanks, Paul. Your next question is from the line of Tao Liani with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, two questions. Um, first is I'm trying to understand the kind of weakness you're seeing. Um, how do you describe it? Is it projects that ended and you just don't see follow-on orders or new projects? Or are there any projects that are in the middle in basically corporate uh, uh, carriers or customers are putting a hold on them and say, you know what, don't continue with your original plan. So I'm trying to understand how severe and what's leading to this uh, break that the put on the break. I think what's leading to it, you know, as I said, is these dynamics mainly to focused on new business initiatives. So where, you know, service providers have to either, um, you know, put stuff through their lab and go through all of that kind of process and integrate into their back office or do large deployments where they need to get out to, you know, multiple sites, et cetera. We've seen a slowdown in those new business initiatives. We have not seen, to your point, which you would see in other, you know, certainly I've seen in other economic recessions where things get canceled and projects get completely put on ice. We haven't seen any of that. You know, it's more about just the velocity of new business initiatives in general slowing down. Um, and then I think what we've seen more recently, and that's something we've pointed out, you know, in, in Q2 that we were seeing, and the cumulative effect of that has certainly accelerated. So it's more about new business. Nothing has really, uh, and folks aren't saying, hey, you know, we're not going to continue with this project. Absolutely none of that. And as I said, you know, we've seen plenty of RFP activity and planning has continued apace. I think what we've seen in the last, you know, couple of months or so is just, uh, you know, increased scrutiny about budget spend, Tal. And really, I think that's related to just caution on behalf of the service providers as they are being hit by issues with the, you know, certain segments of their enterprise customers. So that's very much what we're seeing, you know, and they're running the networks hotter. You know, the secular demand and the RFP activity and their general planning has continued to play through, which is why we think this is, you know, a relatively short-term issue. I'd also uh, come back to India, uh, Tal, because We've had several wins in India this year, uh, but India has been shut down, and the, the spend in India is very, very low. We've gained share. Huawei is being pushed out of uh, India, 
but we're not seeing the activity to, to roll those projects out. So that's that's a significant piece of what's going on here. Got it. Um, my second question is about gross margin. So I, I heard what you said about gross margin, that it's going to be 46 to 48, and I want to take you back a little bit into the history of the company. In prior down cycles, gross margin fluctuated in a great way. I'm talking about 45 to 37 kind of percent. This time you're talking about a slowdown, but no much impact on gross margin. Why? Why don't we see with lower volumes and maybe less project starts, why don't we see greater impact on gross margin? Well, first of all, we're a lot bigger than we were during that time period, and we have a much broader set of customers. But secondly, this is an interesting situation, Tal, in that the effect of this pandemic is to slow down the uh, rollout of new projects, which typically carry lower gross margins. You know, we always have this uh, chassis versus line card effect, and we always, or very often, have the fact that for, to win new projects, we have to uh, make concessions to customers. And um, we're not seeing those kinds of early in life projects roll through our revenue right now. So it's, you know, it's just interesting. We're, we're seeing a, a improved gross margin in this period of low revenue. Now, uh, and I think this persists for a while because we have uh, expectations of a bit lower revenue. However, once we get back to normal and we're winning, we, we think our gross margin is going to come in, the, in a little bit. And as we've said, our run rate margin is 43 to 45%. We believe once we get back to this uh, fully incorporating new wins and uh, new business. Thank you, Paul. Your next question is from the line of Amit Saranani with Evercore. Please go ahead. Um, thanks for taking my question, guys. Um, I guess I have two as well. Uh, you know, first of all, when I think about the softness you guys have been talking about on, on the service provider side, could you perhaps just maybe reflect and tell us when you've seen this happen historically, how long do these soft patches typically last for you? Um, and I guess when I think about service providers wanting to run their network harder without adding more bandwidth, um, I don't imagine they have a lot of flexible capacity lying around. Uh, so when you talk to these service providers, are they, will, are they essentially holding off these projects for a quarter or two? or do you think they'll defer it for much longer than that? I mean, I, you know, having lived through, you know, a number of these uh, downturns personally to it, um, I think, you know, a couple of things I would say. Generally, that, you know, carriers can run their networks hotter for longer than we all sort of would, would, would expect, I would say that. But I would also say that, you know, each of these downturns have their own particular, you know, dynamics. And this one obviously is is driven by the sort of pandemic, uh, and and where, you know, you've also got this this rather, you know, unusual dynamic where capacity increases have happened as we're all working online. So it's a bit sort of counterintuitive in in, in many ways, or a paradox to it. So. You know, I think you look at all of those things, you look at the planning activity as I talked about, and that's why, you know, we're inclined to a view that, you know, depending on what happens with the global economy, you know, all things being equal and we see an amelioration of the impacts of COVID, you know, it's probably, you know, a few quarters, you know, given, given those dynamics. So that's the sort of perspective around it. Perfect. That, that's helpful. And then if I could follow quickly, um, you had extremely impressive free cash flow generation this quarter. Sounds like it should be sustainable. Didn't seem like a one-off thing. Um, how does your capital allocation process change, given the strong free cash flow generation, given what you're seeing in the end market right now? Thank you. Yes, I'd say that we've had uh, strong cash flow really for a couple of years, three years now, going back to 2016 or something like that. So that has continued, and I, I believe that it will continue. Now, with respect to capital allocation. Uh, essentially, our first and most important capital allocation is to fund our business and invest in our business in a way that will drive continued leadership and, in fact, expanded leadership. That means spending on R&D for the projects that we need to, spending to put enough people in the field that we can address customer needs, and finally in the support function so that we can make all that happen. That's our top priority. Other than that, in terms of capital, 
we do spend a little bit on uh, servers and lab equipment and that sort of thing. Uh, but even uh, during this period of time of lower revenue, we're likely to generate excess cash. That's our expectation. And we have had a share repurchase program in place. We did suspend it uh, in the middle of Q2, just out of an abundance of caution. If things continue, I would expect we would do something like that going forward. Now, by the way, we're also interested in doing acquisitions, but we haven't done anything big in a, you know, in a while. Thanks, Annette. Thank you. All right, your next question is from the line of Michael Genovese with MKM Partners. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Um, first, just a clarification. Can you give us any color on how big um, uh, uh, WaveLogic 5 uh, and your uh, Wave server were in the quarter? Scott, Scott has some good statistics on that, and I'll uh, fill in when, um, when he talks. Scott, do you want to take that? Yeah, on the, on the WaveLogic 5 uh, piece, Mike, we, we said we shipped over uh, 1,000 uh, units in, in, uh, in quarter. Um, we extend beyond the quarter um, to you know, today and, and the beginning of the general availability. It's probably pushing more towards the 2000 mark uh, today uh, on a port shipment perspective. Those are split roughly equally between the 6500 family and the wave server family. Did that answer your question, Mike? Uh, yeah, that's great. So, so you know, I, my, 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 my main question is really I want to ask the competition question on a more detailed basis. Um, you had such a strong experience in 400G leadership, um, but now some of the suppliers in the industry are talking about other vendors finally years late coming to market with, with 400G. And then also, you know, given your, your, your 400G experience uh, and how, how well you did, uh, it does seem like one competitor has a pretty compelling 800G offering in trials right now. Um, can you just talk about the competitive environment going forward and, you know, uh, how vigilant you are? And, and, and you know, it's, I, I understand up until now it's been great, but Looking forward, um, could it change, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'd, I'd say Scott, this, you uh, want to take that? Yeah, I'd say this, Mike. Um, you know, I, we, uh, as I said earlier, um, you have actually had uh, a greater rate of design wins at the uh, WaveLogic 5 cycle than we did at the WaveLogic AI cycle, and I think that speaks to, to the competitive strength of the offer. Um, you know, optical performance is one thing, and we're very comfortable with the optical performance, but it's also, you know, the system capabilities um, that go along with that, everything from the client mix that we support, the muxing structures we support, the protection schemes of so the control plane schemes, you know, the uh, back office APIs, et cetera, et cetera, the number of product variants, all of those dimensions we feel very comfortable that we have a leadership position in. All of them are important in terms of customer selection criteria. Thanks. And Michael, I would add, I would add that you know the the best way of measuring that is obviously customer reaction. And if you look at the design wins that we've had, you know, going forward, they're pretty significant, and they takes away, you know, a lot of them from competitive, uh, you know, incumbency. So we're new business, you know, against the incumbent incumbent suppliers, and that's the best way of, of measuring that. And those design wins will translate into into money as we as we go forward. And just to emphasize, by the way, there is no other 800 gig in market right now, and we don't know when there will be a competitive 800 gig in market. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Your next question is from the line of Alex Henderson with Needham. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the split between the degree to which this is a pure macro event associated with weakness and outlook at the service providers versus uh, the ability to do new installs, the ability to do new systems deployments, um, clearly, you've had a lot of design wins, but those design wins are uh, stuck in the pipeline as a result of inability to do uh, deployments. Uh, conversely, 
one could argue that you know the the service provider weakness is somewhat independent of that ability to do installations. So can you split between those two? Uh, and I, I, I think the, the primary question everybody's dancing around here in terms of the question, and I know you don't give guidance beyond one quarter, but should we expect that you know you're hitting the low mark in the October quarter, or is there a risk that uh, you know the January quarter, which is normally seasonally weaker quarter, um, would actually be down as well? Alex, let me take the first part of that, and, and I and I want to be clear around this whole new business piece. First of all, the answer to your question. It's very difficult to discern. You know, this stuff's happening in real time, uh, and it's really difficult to discern the precise delineation between how much of it is, you know, COVID, logistics, et cetera, and how much is economic caution. Um, I, I, would, I would say this. In the, in the velocity uh, of new business, yes, you know, when we started out in this, it was largely logistics, getting people to site and just the speed of all of that stuff. That's still there. I would say that's eased a little bit. Um, the second element to it, though, is the prioritization within these carriers of these new business things. That also, you know, I think they're deprioritizing that to focus on running their networks hotter and, you know, various operational challenges that they've got. So, you know, there's two nuanced but important elements going on there. Um, so it's not all just about sheer logistics. It's about their uh, prioritization of those new business initiatives as well. And the second piece is, which is, you know, I would say more current, or more of a recent phenomenon, is just, you know, their, their hesitancy to release budget. And I think that's really largely by, you know, in talking with the executives at the service providers, they're beginning to feel the impact of exposure to certain enterprise elements, particularly, you know, things like hospitality, retail, transport, all the things that we, you know, we know have been dramatically impacted. That's beginning to show up to the service providers around the world. And that's, you know, I think encouraging caution on their part. So I, I you know, I can't give you a, you know, 50%, 50% answer, uh, Alex, but it, it, it's, it's a blend of those. And with respect to your, the second part of the question, Alex, I know we're not making it any easier on the folks out there who have to do uh, uh, numbers and consensus and all that sort of thing. But we're not in a position right now to talk about 2021. We, we, we're as, an, as low a visibility point as we've been in some time. We're just now uh, working up our 2021 plan, and we'll give you as much information as we can, frankly, uh, when it's appropriate. But for now, we really can't talk about 2021. Well, Thank you. well if I could just follow up uh, one one last point on that same question. It, could you just talk about what the book to bill might be below one again in the October quarter? Because you might have some visibility to that. Uh It'll be because our revenue is lower. We're definitely going to have a much better book to bill in Q4 than we had in Q3. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, All right. Thank on. you. Thanks, Alex. All right. Your next question is from the line of Samik Chatterjee. Would JP Morgan please go ahead? Hey. Um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I guess if I can just start with how um, should I be thinking about the impact uh, of the order slowdown here on your ability to meet the longer term revenue model that you have, 6 to 8 percent in fiscal 21, primarily because it sounds like you will be falling short of that. I'm a bit surprised if we like, take two years, uh, both fiscal 20 and 21, you'll be below that long term model particularly when we've had COVID, which has accelerated bandwidth needs. So maybe any color on that, how you think about fiscal 21, and what are we missing here? Well, Samika, you know, I think obviously we're not talking about longer term stuff here, uh, uh, you know, right now, given what we're seeing. But, you know, just reminded, 2019, we grew over 15 percent, if you're talking about revenues. Um, this year, I think, has been sort of unprecedented in terms of the, uh, you know, the COVID piece. I think, I, and I think, you know, as you say, there's a paradox here in that bandwidth demands have, uh, have gone up, and that's why we think this will be a, a more, a more short-term uh, phenomenon. But obviously, we're not in a position to talk about, you know, future uh, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, forecasts at, uh, at this stage. As, as I'm sure you'd appreciate, you know, we're only just finishing our Q3 anyway. We're one of the few companies that has continued to provide guidance both for full year and we have three-year uh, uh, targets out there as well. And obviously at some point we'll, we'll as we get to probably towards the end of the year, we will, we will look to uh, advise on those. Well, one thing we are confident about is given our fundamental strengths, our market position, our technology, and our people, that we're going to continue to gain market share as we go through the next couple of years or several years because we think that uh, we have the strategy and we have the package to do that, and we intend to. Thank you, Shmeek. That will be the last question of the day. We look forward to speaking with everyone during the course of the day and the next uh, several. We hope you enjoy the holiday season uh, coming up, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for joining today's conference call. This concludes the conference. You may now disconnect.